In this chapter, chapter 7, we're going to study circular motion. The circular motion involves something going in a circle. It means the velocity vector will be changing direction. And that means there will be a acceleration. This is called the centripetal acceleration. And that's a centripetal acceleration. The magnitude of it turns out to be v squared divided by r. And the direction is always to the center of the circle. So this car is going in a circle. There is a force directed to the center of the circle. So let's look at a couple of examples. In the first case, let's look at a car negotiating a curve. The car is coming straight out of the blackboard and going around in a circle centered at the dot here. The reason the car can do this is because of the force of static friction. This force is equal to, the force of static friction is equal to mu times the normal force. And you can see that the normal force is just equal to the weight in this case. So let's take an example, and uh, that force of static friction is in fact the centripetal force, so it's equal to mv squared divided by r. So let's take an example of um, a 900 kilogram car making a 180 degree turn at a speed of 10 meters per second and the radius of the circle is 25 meters. Determine the force of friction and the coefficient of friction acting upon the car. So one of the things you will see here is that the mass in this equation cancels off so that mu just equal to v squared over rg and for these numbers mu will turn out to be 0 0.4 for v equals 10 r equals 25 and g equals 9.8 uh, now if mu coefficient of friction is 0.4 then what's the no What's the force of friction? Well, the force of friction will be mu times the normal force, or mg. So that will equal to 0 0.4 times 900 times 9.8. And so the force of friction will be 3,600 newtons. Now, it's possible for a car to negotiate a turn without any friction at all. And this is done by doing uh, a, a bank turn. Like this car is still coming out at us, but it's on a, on a hill. It's on a bank coming out straight at us. Since it's going in a circle, there is a center of that circular motion right here. That means directed to the center of that circle must be some kind of force called the centripetal force. So the question is, what is that centripetal force? Normally, we have drawn our x-axis at an angle with the plane, uh, but in this case, it's more convenient to, to keep the x-axis the way we normally do, vertically and the y-axis, uh, horizontally and the y-axis vertically, like so. These will be the two forces acting on the car. There's only two forces. One, the weight, mg, is down, and the normal force, f sub n, is up. One of these forces provides the centripetal force, or at least part of it. And that part, of course, is part of the normal force. If we were to resolve the normal force, fn, into components, we would see that the x component is fn sine theta and the y component is fn cosine theta where theta is the angle of the plane this angle here and also it happens to be this angle here so this is in fact the uh, fn sine theta is in fact the centripetal force so since there's no motion in the y direction, all the forces in the y direction have to add up to zero. 
Well, there's only two forces in the y direction, the normal force, the uh, y component of the normal force, and therefore that has to equal to the weight. This tells us that the normal force is equal to the weight divided by cosine of theta. Now, in the x direction, there's only one force. Some of the forces in the x direction has to equal ma, where a is the centripetal acceleration. And there's only one force. It's fn sine of theta. And that has to equal to mv squared over r. What we're going to do here, we're going to substitute this value for the normal force substituted here. And if we do that, we will see that uh, by substituting Fn mg cosine theta for Fn here, we get mg over cosine theta times sine theta. Now, sine over cosine is tangent of theta so we get g tangent of theta and therefore the velocity that we can have for a particular given angle is given by the formula on the bottom here solving this equation here for v for example supposing that the angle of the plane here is 10 degrees and the radius is equal to 30 meters the question is how fast can we go on this particular hill to make it and we will see basically by using this equation here just plugging in the values we can actually solve for the velocity the velocity is going to equal to g 9.8 times r which is 30 times the tangent of 10 degrees and we need to take the square root of that whole thing so if you do the calculations you will find that the velocity is 2.3 meters per second the required velocity Let's do another application of centripetal force a little different from here. Let's, uh, first of all, let's take a look at the following. Uh, an object is let go from point A and it goes around a loop-de-loop -loop, uh, to point B and also it comes down and lands here on point C. And the question we'd like to do, what is the normal force at point B and C? We can actually draw those in this particular uh, case. When the point is, when the uh, object is down at the bottom, the normal force is up and its weight is down. When the object is at the top, both of them are down. So let's write the equation. At point B, for example, we have the normal forces up, the weight is down, so the sum of those two have to add up to the centripetal force.
that's at the bottom. At the top, both those forces are down, so they're both negative. So the, the weight is down, the normal force is down, but they still have to add up to mv squared over r. That's the difference between them. So this is at point C. This would be the equation governing the object when it is at point C. Both forces are down. They're both negative. But they have to add up to mv squared over r. And at the bottom, uh, the normal force is, is up. And the weight is down. One of the questions that we want to answer here, what is the minimum value of H over here? What is the minimum value of this height so that the object just makes it to the top? Now, for it to just makes it, what happens is at the very top, the normal force is equal to zero. So, therefore, the only force that's left is Mg if the normal force is zero at the top. So, Mg has to be, in fact, the centripetal force, mv squared over r. The mass is canceled. And therefore, if you solve this equation for v, you get uh, the, the velocity that it needs to have is the square root of rg. Solving this for v. Just to make it to the top, it must have this velocity. So the question now, if we go down to the bottom, we can see what is h so that the velocity at this point c is equal to that, square root of rg. So we use conservation of energy. The total energy at point A, which is mgh, is equal to the total point energy at point C, which is 1 half mv squared, where v is this, plus mg2r. This is, this is the potential energy, mgh prime at point C, h prime is equal to twice the radius. You see here, twice the radius is the height. So by setting those two equal to each other and then plug it in for v squared just rg which is done right here. And plug it in for v squared rg. All the masses will cancel. So gh is equal to just 2.5 rg. h will equal to 2.5 times the radius of the circle. In the second part of chapter 7, we apply circular motion to the force of gravity. But before that, we just def define Newton's law of gravity, the gravitational force. And basically what it says is that any two masses, let's say these two apples, or an apple and a planet, planet Earth, like on the right, any two masses attract one another. Newton's law of gravity. The force of attraction is proportional to the product of the two masses. And what that means is that if you double one mass, the force doubles. If you double the other mass, the force doubles. If you double both masses, the force becomes four times as big. So this applies to any two masses. The mass could be two apples or two planets or an apple and a planet as we see in the picture on the right here. Now this force also drops off as one over the distance squared. It peters out. The further you get away, the more it drops off. And the one over distance squared just means that if you double the force, if you double the distance, the force will be one fourth of what it was. If you triple it, it will be one ninth. If you quadruple it, it will be one sixteenth. Putting both of these together, we see we can come up with the law of gravity that says that the force of attraction between any two masses, any two masses, is given by this equation, where g is called the universal gravitational constant. It's a constant that has to be measured experimentally. Uh, m is the mass of one of the masses, and, b, and big M is the mass of the other masses, and R is the distance between them from center to center. So, just to see uh, how the force of gravity works, supposing we have two objects, each with mass m 
originally did some distance r apart. And the force of gra uh, gravitational attract of, of, of attraction between them is F. If both the masses are doubled, what will be the force now? Stop the video and see if you can figure it out. So originally, the force is given by this equation. And it's equal to F. Now, what happens if both masses are doubled? Well, what that means, the new force, that's called F prime, will be equal to G times the new mass, which is instead of M, is going to be 2M. And the other mass also, instead of big M, is going to be 2 big M. The distance between them remains the same. So this turns out to be This turns out to be 4 g little m times big M over r squared. Now, g m times big M over r squared, if you look back, it's the original force F. So this is going to be equal to 4 times F. So we, we can see now exactly what weight is. Weight, in fact, is that this force of attraction between an apple or some other mass on the planet Earth and the planet Earth itself. The little m is the weight of the apple here, the red apple, and the big M is the mass of the Earth. So that is what we define gravity. Uh, therefore, weight, what we called weight, uh, if we drop something, the force acting on it is the weight force that pulls it down to the center. And that's equal to the mass of the apple times the acceleration, which we have called g. So mg is, in fact, this particular. And so what that tells us is the m's will cancel here, that g, that's ac acceleration due to gravity, is, in fact, equal to, given by this equation. And what that means, if you go to a different planet, a different planet will have a different mass and a different radius, g will be different. Things will fall at a different rate. And this equation tells you what g is at that planet. So, for example, supposing we go to another planet that is twice as massive as the Earth but half the size. So what would g be on this planet? So here's the two planets, Earth and now we go to another planet that is twice as massive, but half the size. You can see it's smaller than Earth, but it's twice as massive. So this is M. The mass of this will be 2M. And if the radius here is R, the radius here will be 1 half R. So using this equation, stop the video and see if you can figure out what would G be on this planet compared to G on Earth. It would be twice F, four, eight times, or ten times as much. Okay, so G on this new planet, let's call it G prime, is going to equal to G, the original gravitation constant, times the mass of this new planet. Now, the mass of the new planet is twice the mass of Earth. And the radius of this planet is one-half the radius of Earth. But you have to square it. So this is equal to two divided by one-fourth, that's one-half squared, is one-fourth, m over r squared. And so for g prime is going to equal to eight g m over r squared. Now don't forget g m over r squared, or that's the g on earth. M is the mass of the Earth, the R is the radius of the Earth, so it's going to equal to the original G. This will be 8 times the original G. Uh, another another uh, application of this, application of circular motion, is that if something is going in a circle, this force between, let's say, a planet going around the sun, 
this force between them, between the, the planet and the sun, is in fact a centripetal force. So in this case, uh, the little red M is the mass of the planet, and the big blue M is the mass of the sun. And that force is equal to mv squared over r. If we solve this equation for v, first thing we can see is that the masses will cancel off. Oops. I have to cancel off the old way with a pen. So the mass here cancels off the mass here. And we solve that equation for v. We see that this it's in fact the velocity of orbit of planets around the sun in other words the velocity de depends on the radius or how far the planet is from the sun the further far it is its velocity of orbit around the sun is slower m in this equation here is in fact the mass of the sun and m of the planet has cancelled off so that tells you the further each planet is from the sun the slower it is going this also applies to satellites orbiting a planet, like satellites orbiting the Earth or the Moon orbiting the Earth. The velocity of these satellites is given by this equation. And if the satellite is right near the Earth, then that r is approximately the radius of the Earth. But if the satellite is like where the Moon is, then that r is 60 times the radius of the Earth. It's much further away. So here we can see one, one more time that the uh, velocity of satellites depends on the distance from the center r. And again, this particular case we're looking at a satellite going around the earth, uh, but the equation is the same. The velocity of the satellite, if it's right near the earth's surface, that means approximately the radius of the earth, maybe a little bit more away, that the velocity is, is given by this equation. I'd like to solve uh, this particular problem. This, supposing there was a planet discovered for a period of five years, what would be the mean distance of the planet? How far away it is from the sun? Now, this problem requires to utilize Newton's third law, which states, here, which states that for any planet, the time for it to go around the sun divided by the distance it is away from the sun in astronomical units. If the time is in years and the astronomical unit and the distance is in astronomical units, then the time squared divided by the distance cubed is the same for all the planets. Now one of the planets that we know this for right now is the Earth. The time in years for the Earth to go around the sun is one and the distance that the Earth is away from the sun is one astronomical unit. Both of these are one. So one squared divided by one cubed gives you one. And it turns out this is the same for all the planets. As long as the time is in years and the distance is in astronomical units. So we can use this to solve this problem that we put up originally. Supposing a small planet were discovered with a period of five years, what would be the distance that it was away from the sun? Well, what this means is that for this particular planet time squared over distance cubed equals one or the time squared equals distance cubed now we are given time as five years the time to go around the sun and we want to find out what in fact is the distance r so 25 squared equals r cubed what number cubed gives you 25 it turns out 2.92 would be the answer to this problem so let's try this one if a satellite is orbiting the Earth at a distance of 7 Earth radii, or 7R, what would it be, be its speed in kilometers per second? Stop the video and work it out. Okay, the hint here is to use this equation. That the velocity of orbit near the Earth's surface is given by that equation, and if the, and R in that equation is just the radius of the Earth, and the, the orbital velocity, if you remember, 
from classes eight kilometers per second. So we're going to change in this equation, uh, replace R by seven times R. So what do we get? We get that the velocity is going to equal to the square root of gm over 7 r. Or we can write this another way as 1 over the square root of 7 times the square root of gm over r. Now we know that this quantity here, square root of gm over r, is 8. 8 kilometers per second. So this will be 1 over, divided by the square root of 7, which is 0 0.38 times 8. And that should give you approximately 3 kilometers per second. So this particular satellite particular satellite right over here, if it was right near the Earth's surface orbiting the Earth, it would be going around 8 kilometers per second. But at this distance, it's only going around at 3 kilometers per second. Let's try these problems. How much would an apple weigh if it was on a planet that was twice as massive than Earth but had one half the radius? This is already, we already did this before. So G in this planet would change by This is G of the original planet, where R is the radius of the Earth. Now you go to a new planet, and G here will be, let's call it G prime, 2M divided by 1 half R squared. And we already know this would be 8 times GM over R squared. So it will be 8, it will be eight times as much. As it, as it weighs on Earth. And this last problem, an apple weighs 12 newtons on Earth. How much would it weigh if it were twice as far away? And we know that since the force of gravity drops off as 1 over distance squared, it would be 1 fourth as much. So it would be 1 fourth of 12, or 3 newtons.